So you may be asking yourself on why we're spending so much time on transcription and on translation. And the reason for this is because proteins are what are going to give us our various phenotypes. And the proteins are what are going to be important in heredity. So we're just going to go through a couple of examples that we know about. Um, Alcaptonuria and phenylketonuria are going to result from mutations that lead from metabolic blocks. And I'll show you where that happens in just a second. But there are just hundreds of medical conditions that can be caused by errors in metabolism resulting from different mutant genes. And there's still a lot of study going on trying to figure out what genes are going to cause different diseases. These ones, though, are particularly clear. We know that pedigree analysis indicated that they do have a genetic basis. What's happening in the phenylketonuria, or PKU, phenyl, the amino acid phenylalanine is not converted to tyrosine. And so there's an enzyme for this process called phenylalanine hydroxylase, and it is inactive in affected individuals. So what happens is phenylalanine, its derivatives, they build up. They enter the cerebral spinal fluid, elevated levels, and they result in mental retardation. If you catch it early, and in fact in the US and many other countries, newborns are routinely screened at birth, and you put someone on um, a special diet so that they don't eat any phenylalanine, you basically can have a pretty much normal outcome, pretty much normal life. So let's look at some of the different steps in this pathway. So here's phenylalanine, okay? Um, the block here, phenylketonuria, this enzyme, it's just one particular enzyme that gets mutated in these individuals. They do not have this phenylalanine hydroxylase, or don't have a functioning enzyme at least. So they can't go from phenylalanine to tyrosine. They can make this other product that can build up and cause mental retardation at high levels. Tyrosine then, can be broken down um, to several different components. Another single gene uh, trait is if there's a, a block here, tyrosine transaminase, this particular enzyme is mutated or not functioning correctly, you can cause problems here. There are many other enzymes. Um, eventually, these can all lead to the citric acid cycle. Remember that amino acids can enter the citric acid cycle they do need to be converted a few different ways before that can happen. They can then be used for energy, they can be broken down completely to carbon dioxide along with electron carriers. Those electron carriers um, can then be used through chemiosmosis to create ATP for a cell. Another related block that people don't realize is actually related is from tyrosine to this DOPA, there's an enzyme called tyranase tyrosinase. If this is mutated, these individuals have albinoism. The reason why, downstream, look to see what's made, melanin pigments. This is important for skin, for hair, and so on. If they're not being able to be made, the individual is not going to be having these compounds, and they're going to have the typical albino uh, skin color and skin tone. So studies, um, very, very classic studies, Beetle and Tatum studied the mold neurospora. And what they found was that the loss of an enzymatic activity basically catalyzes essential reactions in wild type organisms. And so they found these nutri nutritional mutations that they found in this bread mold. And they just did a whole bunch of studies with it. So this led, us to, or led them to the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. It's very, very important. So what they did first was um, they've got their yeast and they gave it either x-ray or UV irradiation, something to cause some mutations. In most of the cells, it's able to grow on both this complete me medium as well as this minimal medium. In this case, they did not induce any mutations. However, they did expect that in many of these cells, they would have mutations so that they would be able to grow on the complete medium but not be able to grow in the minimal medium. And so they were lacking something here that they weren't able to grow on this particular medium. 
So what they did, they found, well, what was it lacking? They had took this complete medium, they didn't grow in the minimal medium, they added vitamins, didn't grow, added some nucleotides, these purines and pyrimidines, didn't grow, added amino acids, aha! And now it could grow. So in this case, it was only able to grow when they added this amino acid supplement. And so what they, they concluded from this was that their mutant could not synthesize a particular amino acid. So then they wanted to know, well, which one? So they took um, complete medium, again, it was able to grow, the minimal medium, not able to, to grow, this is a good positive control, this is their good negative control, and they added several different amino acids. And as you can see, when they added back tyrosine, now their mutant was able to grow. And so they concluded that, that whatever mutation that they made affected the synthesis of tyrosine. So they were tyrosine minus, or tyrosine mutants. So other studies, um, in particular studies of human hemoglobin, established that one gene encodes one polypeptide. It's just a little bit more specific to say that. Um, and the reason for this is because, first of all, not all proteins are enzymes, right? Some proteins have important other functions. Uh, and also some proteins are going to have more than one subunit. So they've just modified this and now we call it the one gene, one polypeptide chain instead. So one example of this would be sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is going to be a recessive genetic disease. Afflicted individuals are going to be homozygous uh, for this sickle cell trait. Heterozygotes are carriers, but they're going to be largely unaffected. And when you look at an individual who has this under the microscope, an individual who's normal or an individual who's a carrier, heterozygote carrier, they're going to have normal red blood cells. Those that have sickle cell anemia, their red blood cells are going to have this sort of sickle shape to them, and um, their hemoglobin is not going to be functioning correctly. So, <clears throat> so what they did was they found that um, this fingerprinting, uh, and we'll talk about what that means in just a second, but the fingerprinting demonstrated that the sickle cell and the HBA hemoglobins differ by just a single peptide fragment, so just a single amino acid change. The way that um, it happens is you have a gel. It's going to be negative charge on one end, a positive charge on one end. You'll load your samples onto here. In this case, they have an individual who was homozygous for the normal trait, heterozygous, and someone who was homozygous for the sickle cell trait. After applying electric charge to this gel through electrophoresis, these are going to separate out based on size and charge. Okay, those that are a little bit um, faster are going to have a little bit different composition than those that are going to migrate slower. And what you can see is that after this migration, you can see distinctly two different bands. Those who are homozygous normal are going to be this pretty fast moving band. Those who are homozygous recessive are going to have this a little slightly slower. Those who are heterozygous are going to have both fragments. So then you can figure out, you can um, separate it out and see what are the exact peptides involved in this process. And what you can see here highlighted in orange is this altered peptide. You can isolate it out, you can figure out which one it is, and they did this. And what they found was that in this case, whereas someone who is normal has a glutamate, individuals who have the sickle cell trait are going to have a valine instead. Everything else, though, is pretty much exactly the same. So really, just one single amino acid change can have a dramatic uh, impact on this individual.